All right, hello. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bears Rebecca Fonte. I am on the board of Eaglyph as well as the technical director of the festival. And I'm very lucky to have with me the writer, director, and star of Lingua Franca, Isabel Sandoval. Hi everyone. Thank you Bears for having me here tonight. And uh, thank you for everyone to everyone who came to watch Lingua Franca here at Eaglyph. Well, thank you for sharing your film with us. It's been uh, on my mind since I first watched it about a week and a half ago in preparation for talking to you. It's the kind of film that kind of sticks with you for forever um, in, a, in a good way. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to start with the dullest question that every, um, that every Q&A starts with. But I think with this one, with this film, it, it, it does make sense to ask because you decided not just to write this film, not just to direct it, but that you had star in it. So can you tell me a little bit about the creation of the, of the project and uh, you know, why you wanted to tell this story and why you wanted to be the one to tell it and the one to star in it? Yeah, um, so Lingua Franca is my third feature film, but it is my first after my gender transition and it is my first to be shot in and produced in the US, even though I already you know, lived you know, close to 10 years in the U.S. at that time. But, you know, I, sh I shot my first two films in the Philippines, which is where I'm from originally. And, you know, I started writing Lingua Franca as I was going through my gender transition. And um, I continued writing it as Trump got elected to the White House. So... You know, I was feeling a lot of the anxiety and vulnerability and the uncertainty that a lot of minorities, you know, um, were grappling with at that time. And I feel that, you know, as a filmmaker, the French, you know, master Jean Cocteau once said that filmmakers make the same movie over again, you know, or they revisit the same themes. They just shuffle the cards, you know, in a different way with each new movie and kind of my thematic obsession or fixation are women who are marginalized or disadvantaged who are forced to confront and make very personal choices in a fraught sociopolitical setting. And I guess, you know, the political climate that I was living in and also what I was going through personally with my gender transition really was what um, inspired the premise for Lingua Franca. And yeah, I came up with the story of Olivia. And although, you know, we are both, Olivia and I are both tra Filipina trans women living in Brooklyn, um, the similarities of, you know, between us and there, and the film is purely autobiographical, I mean, not autobiographical, but purely fictional besides that. And yeah, I thought, and I'd actually, you know, thought about shelving the project for some time, you know, after Trump got elected, but I spoke with my producers and they were telling me that, you know, if there's a time to make this film, that time is now more than ever. And they were right. And now here we are and I'm very um, happy that I ended up making Lingua Franca. Well, it, you know, you chose to make the story more than just the story of s someone who's trans, but like, it's super complicated, you know? There could be a story about, you know, trying to get your green card and marrying somebody you didn't know. There could be a story about taking care of somebody that you don't really know in an elder hostile situation and, and, and um, having a relationship with, you know, her son. And there could be a story about being trans and going through gender transition. So you gave yeah. Olivia all of those things all at once. Why, why did you want to pile on your heroine so much? Um, I think that's because that's reality. You know, reality is complex. It's not just a single issue um, kind of theme or narrative. And I think that's kind of become my forte as a storyteller and as a filmmaker in that my characters do not live in a vacuum or they do not live in a society where they're just, you know, one kind of identity, you know, and I think that's also the benefit of me coming or 
you know, from those different communities and that I'm able to see Olivia and flesh her out as a multidimensional character in terms of, you know, not just her race or immigration status, but also her, her psyche, most importantly. And yeah, I think it was, I'd like to think that, you know, if we view Lingo Franca as a transgender drama, it's unique in the sense that it starts where a lot of transgender films tend to end, especially if they're directed by cisgender, you know, like male directors, which almost always tend to depict the gender transition process, which is, you know, I'm not saying that's not a val valid subject to, um, to focus on, but there are other aspects and facets to the transgender experience that needs to be portrayed. Can, can you and I just agree that cisgender white men shouldn't be able to direct our stories anymore? Because I'm really fucking tired of it. Yeah. Um, okay, so now that we've got that agreed upon, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess there's no deeper on that. We just okay. agree on that. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, one of the things that I feel like I get to ask you that I would not want other people doing Q and A's to ask um, because they don't get to ask these questions. Uh, I feel like when I'm watching a story about somebody who's transgender and they pass for most, you know, for the whole film, right? There's that moment in the story where someone finds out and it's always a, you know, it's a big traumatic moment. And I think that when you're writing that story, especially with these characters, there's a big decision point on where in the story does that happen and how does it affect the plot and how does it affect the characters? So tell me a little bit about the choice that you made in terms of where you set it and how you wanted it to play in the rest of the rest of the film. Yeah, um, you know, Olivia happens to, and I hate to use the term, pass, you know, um, for at least the third, first third of the film until um, Alex's friend, you know, finds out and tells him. I wanted to include that because I think that's a reality and a fear that, you know, a lot of transgender individuals face, especially trans women. And I certainly, you know, dealt with that. But I wanted to deviate from where, you know, cisgender <laughs> male directors tend to take um, the story directionally from that point in that it usually steers you towards episodes or interludes of physical violence. And so I wanted to focus still on the other types of violence that transgender women might be subjected to. And that's more insidious because they're not as obvious or explicit. And that's, you know, the, the psychological, emotional violence that is, you know, represented by the gaslighting that Alex does to her, you know, like exploiting her deepest fears and anxieties against her. Um, and I wanted to do that because I think it's, it's a more offbeat take on the violence that transgender women, uh, transgender women face. And also, I think it makes Lingo Franca a drama of interiority in that both, you know, Olivia and Alex are characters that are inward and introverted because out of a, you know, a kind of shame or guilt about their particular circumstances. Olivia, you know, being an undocumented immigrant, you know, is ashamed of her status and as she's becoming emotionally involved with a man who is not initially aware that she's transgender, she's also fearing for her safety. So there's a kind of ambivalence, you know, and internal conflict that's going on with her. And in Alex's case, you know, he grew up in and was raised in an environment that was misogynistic, you know, and homophobic and transphobic. And he's dealing with the shame of being found out by his peers that he is attracted to and is emotionally drawn to someone who might be transgender. So 
between these two characters, they spend, I think, the course of the film trying to confront that internalized shame or guilt. And although at the very end of the film, I don't tie up those you know, issues with any Tao and resolve everything, I think that they're able to go through that process individually and they're coming to a certain illumination, you know, and understanding about how to accept themselves and deal with those feelings. Um, Lingua Franca is ironic as a title because although Lingua Franca means bridge language between immigrants, which is English in this case, you know, what is most important in the film are the things that are left unsaid and are left unarticulated and the things that they withhold from each other. Well, I'll tell you something. I may have had a different um, response than most people watching the film because I, for some reason, I thought maybe I just assumed or I wanted it to be th true. I thought he knew. I, I convinced myself yeah. that he knew. Um, and so that when he was getting together with her, mm -hmm. Um, that he was already aware of her status and the fact that she was transgender. And I remember thinking while I was watching the love scene, which is a beautiful, a beautiful love scene, which is so rare to see something that's shot well and artfully, but, you know, also was really damn sexy, which was really great. You know, it was a beautiful love scene. And, and in my mind, it was like, wow, this is a great scene between someone who's transgender and someone who who is just accepting her and, and then when it was like oh wait I'm wrong and I'm trying to figure out what what I missed and maybe it was just that I just assumed since he was accepting her for who she was in the house he was just accepting her uh, and, and it, she has so many layers of things that that she needs to admit or get permission for it's like we have a world that Olivia's in in which she has so many different like layers of herself that she has to reveal in order just to be herself. Yeah, I think you know that love scene is also interesting. I think unique in American cinema in that love scenes tend to focus on the act itself. It doesn't focus on the character, but here we stay on her face. You know, as she's experiencing pleasure and those ambivalent feelings of she's allowing her, you know, herself this enjoyment you know, this feeling of sensuality, but also the ambivalence. And, you know, I, I want the audience to keep seeing her and not objectify her, but see her as a sentient, you know, um, character with agency. And, you know, like your interpretation, I always think that I feel that art that lends itself to numerous and and different interpretations is rich and complex because, you know, a piece of art is kind of just one stimulus and every audience member, you know, every appreciator brings into their interpretation of that work of art, their own backgrounds and impressions and ideas. And if that's how you interpret, I mean, it could very well be right that in, you know, internally, maybe he didn't know, but it was only after someone that he knows knew that he was attracted to someone like her. See, that's what I, that's what I thought to me, you know, and, yeah. and I think maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe it is an internal thing. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that, I don't know, it was just an extra layer that made it interesting to me. Um, so you did sort of let the cat out of the bag about the end, and that's okay because I'm assuming everybody who's watching this Q&A has watched the movie. So let's talk about yes. your super cheery ending where everybody rides off into the sunset happily ever after. Right. Um, <laughs> I have to uh, thank you for making it so, like, you know, unobtrusively just honest and and not uh, not tying up all the loose ends for us, but uh, you know, especially just showing how these complicated relationships don't don't end simply. Can you talk a little bit about the decision about ending the film that way? And if you had anybody who read the script or worked on the film along the way who tried to make maybe push you one way or another, not that you know, not that you would take that. Yeah, we had some you know, investors in the Philippines who hated ending. 
they just hated it. Um, but I had creative control, so I stuck stuck to my ending, <laughs> and it got into Venice, you know. So um, I understand that it's a polarizing and divisive ending because, on one hand, her decision might seem counterintuitive and impractical to someone in her situation and predicament because if she had accepted the proposal, it would have been the easy way out, you know, of her of her drama for the entire movie. But I think by having her decide what on, on the surface seems to be against her better judgment, I feel like I'm inviting the viewer, you know, to really being closer and pay attention and see her beyond being a transgender woman, an immigrant and put themselves in her shoes and view the situation from her perspective because, you know, accepting his proposal would be tantamount to essentially committing herself to someone who had exploited and taken advantage of her at her most vulnerable point, someone who betrayed her trust ultimately. And I guess it also inadvertently at that moment, I'm revealing that she did care enough for him to, to be hurt and to care about his betrayal. Um, and yeah, and I feel like the, you know, the people, the viewer who do that emotional legwork to kind of arrive at that decision that she, she ultimately got to would truly appreciate the film. Um, you know, and yeah, I feel like that complexity and that subtlety makes the film ultimately, if not satisfying, then really distinctive. Um, I feel like, you know, what I learned making these three, my three films is because I didn't go to film school is that people don't re remember your plot necessarily or don't they don't remember the characters, but they won't forget how your film makes made them feel. And if that emotional experience is so singular and distinctive and unique, they usually that makes the film stay with with that person longer. Right. You know, and, yeah. Well, I'm thinking about her in comparison to her friend. You know, her friend yeah. is in the same situation and she's in a relationship that is clearly a, a sort of a commodity-driven relationship. I mean, she's given herself over to the fact that she she's not in it for any emotional attachment. It, it, it's mm -hmm. purely just, you know, it, it, it's purely just a relationship of convenience. And she seems to be looking for something better than that, or at least she knows that she's not going to be happy, right? And so she has that moment of, like you said, where she gives, she gives into the moment and actually allows herself to enjoy um, the relationship. And then when she loses that, when, when she is that hurt because she lets somebody in and she, and she goes for something that isn't a commodity, then after that, then what do you have, what do you have left? You know, you tried, you tried that and it didn't work out. So yeah now she is going to go to something that is commodity based and in the end who's going to be happier is it going to be her or is it going to be her friend who had had settled on that in the first place yeah and that the audience will have to think about you know <laughs> as they leave the movie and I, but i also wanted to um with her decision to turn him down i wanted to show this character gain back her agency and her ability to determine her path going forward, you know, her own destiny. And even though her immigration status continues to be uncertain, you know, and bleak at that point, at least she can tell herself that she's deciding for herself and not some other person. And, you know, the very last line in the film, although the final scene is, you know, Olga in the kitchen, trying to, you know, make a phone call. The very last line that we see in the film is a voice over Olivia, where she's telling her mother on the phone that 
you know, we'll get there eventually. It's a line of resilience, of survival. And that life, go, life goes on for not just Olivia. And at that point, I feel like my perspective is kind of shifting back to not just this one individual person, but the plight of undocumented immigrants in general and that life goes on for them. And they're going to continue to struggle and fight another day in New York City. What's it, what's it like to be trans in the Philippines? Uh, what, what was the life that she was leaving behind that, that made New York City or just America in general the, the place she wanted to get to? Um, I think New York City is definitely just a, progress, more, a lot more progressive and liberal place. Um, and, you know, personally, if I had stayed in the Philippines, I don't think I would ever transition. It's just rough. Um, is it is it worse right now under Duterte? Um, not necessarily, but the Philippines is predominantly Catholic, and you know it's ninety five percent Catholic and neurotically so. <laughs> and you know, just growing up, you know, we are fed this specific um, type of femininity where you know it's being trans means to become you know hyper feminine or essentially a barbie doll or kardashian and it's just not something that i related to i mean growing up my role models were i mean there's nothing wrong about that but i feel like femininity is just reduced to that quality and a lot of you know that how trans women are portrayed in philippine media and popular culture are you know they're essentially portrayed as flamboyant gay men who are salivating over men, you know, and their sense of identity and self-esteem is associated with, you know, their attachment to men. And I was drawn more and I idolized stronger, independent, you know, headstrong type of women. And it was only after moving here to the US when I started, you know, seeing on YouTube, different transgender people documenting and chronicling their own transition online and sharing about their own experiences. And th these are people from different backgrounds. These are writers, you know, people who work for nonprofit organizations. These are people with families, for instance, that I could say that, I mean, I was able to tell myself, you know, I'm asking myself the same questions that these people are. And these are people with diverse backgrounds. And then I realized that there's just not a single way to be transgender. And ultimately, and I'm speaking from my own experience of transition, I'm not transitioning necessarily to become a woman, but I'm transitioning to become more fully myself. And that's how I feel now. I, I feel so powerful and I feel that, you know, there are no limits and I can, I, I can accomplish anything that I want, you know, I set my mind and heart on. That's great. Me too. <laughs> um, so from an immigrant perspective, is, yeah. is it, would it be better for somebody coming into the country to have their presentation match their gender, their gender marker on their passport or whatever, their birth certificate? Or does it matter? I was very curious about the ins and outs, especially that scene in which um, the friend is at the, um, you know, is, is at the, the marriage license department and there's a question about what the original passport says. Certainly, and also internationally, I feel, you know, just traveling. I'm lucky in that um, I'm at a point where my presentation matches the picture in the passport, um, even though the Philippines passed a law prohibiting transgender people from changing their name and gender marker. The law didn't exist before that, but they went out of the way to become bigots, you know. Um, <laughs> but I can only imagine how much more challenging and daunting it would be for someone to be traveling where you know, their you know, physical appearance does not match the picture in their passport. And that's why I actually did not, when Trump got elected, I had not traveled internationally until the film premiered at the Venice Film Festival. So my trip to Italy was my first trip outside the United States in five years at that point. And, you know, 
I was nervous the whole time while I was abroad whether I would be able to come back in just because of, you know, especially last, you know, the last few years, there's just been, you know, like um, bills and executive orders passed one after the other, you know, targeting transgender people plus immigrants as well. And so I was really, you know, it was a nerve wracking experience lining up for passport control as I was landing on J at on JFK and, Thankfully, I was with my producer at that time who knew which passport control officer to, you know, yeah. line up to so that I actually made it through quite easily. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's um, an anxiety that I deal with every time I travel abroad. Yeah. So here's a question from our artistic director, Jim Brunzel. Um, he says that your film had such an authentic and original voice, and he's wondering what other films and directors were your inspiration for this particular film. Um, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, um, Ali Fear Eats the Soul, which itself is kind of based on, you know, Douglas Sirk melodramas from the 50s with um, Rock Hudson. <laughs> and... Um, also, um, the films of James Gray, who directed, you know, who's shot and directed a bunch of films set in Brighton Beach area, like Two Lovers with Joaquin Phoenix and Gwyneth Paltrow. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, this in French film magazine called Cahiers du Cinema, when they reviewed the film back in March, they referenced Two Lovers. So I'm, you know, viewing the experience of immigrants in America, but with a foreigner's eye. Um, so one thing I'm really curious when you, when you write a script and then you, um, you know, see it all the way through to the end, what was a scene that was at the very, very kernel of, of um, the writing of the script, something that you knew was gonna end up in the movie, you know, that came to you like perfectly created that ended up pretty much the way you imagined it exactly in the film when it's done? Um, her, her sensual fantasy slash interlude. Yeah, I wanted to portray, you know, this, this woman as, you know, having, as being sensual and to have that trans female gaze in, in the film. I know the film is um, set to come out really soon. Can you tell us about the release in America? Yes. Um, uh, so Lingua Franca has been acquired for North America by Ava DuVernay's distribution arm called Array, and it will be premiering on Netflix in the US and Canada on Wednesday, August 26th. Great. So everybody, if you love this film, please spread the word. Let everybody know that they will be able to watch it free. Because by now, we all have a Netflix subscription. Let's just be honest. Most people, I think, yes. <laughs> Quarantine. So that must be really great for you as an artist to know that your film is going to get out to most of the world almost immediately. Yeah, um, you know, it's very exciting. And of course, I want to you know, leverage the momentum that the film has to um, get interest in my upcoming feature that I um, had finished the script for. Which, which is what? What can you tell us about it? Sure. It is called Tropical Gothic. So it is a colonial drama with surrealist elements. It's set in the 16th century in the Philippines about um, a native woman, a native priestess who pretends to be possessed by the ghost of her Spanish master's dead fiance in order to escape persecution as a witch. That sounds absolutely amazing. Well, <laughs> and it's a riff on Hitchcock's vertigo. Oh, make it, make it please and bring it to Austin. Yes. Because we really miss, you know, having you here. Hopefully next, you know, next time there won't be a pandemic and I'd love to yeah. visit Austin. I was there for- No more pandemics and yeah. no more Trump next time. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Isabel, for sharing your film with us and for taking the time to talk with us. We're really proud to have shown the film as part of Aglyph, and um, we can't wait to see more of your work. 
Thank you so much, Paris. And thank you to Jim, to Aglyf, and to everyone in Austin. Please stay safe as well. And have right. a good evening. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.